tonight we're very fortunate to have Dr. Matthew Morris from Ambrose University, who is a associate professor of biology at the university there, who specializes in things related to kind of fish. That's kind of his his background in a sense, which is great. Um, I did actually have a little guide here on fish. Um, I think, and, and Matthew, you're a, a co-author of this, I believe. Yeah, is, that's correct. Yeah, it's it's a great guide for fish if those for those who like fish watching. Um, he's, uh, Dr. Morris is involved with uh, local adaptations, population genetics, uh, phenotypic plasticity, DNA barcoding. And related to DNA barcoding, we had Dr. Morris a while back doing a talk about doing a barcoding in a sense of the different fish which are available in stores that people buy just to see what they are being sold as were actually what they are, which was very interesting. <laughs> Uh, kind of surprising in some sense as well. So um, it, was a, it was a great um, opportunity to have Dr. Morris to speak to us tonight about the, the fishes of Alberta. So without further ado, I would like to offer uh, Matthew Morris an opportunity to share his screen and, and provide us with a stimulating talk on the fish of Alberta. Hey, well, thank you so much, John. Uh, thank you for the invitation. I, I really appreciate uh, the chance to come out and, and chat with you all. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm maybe a bit of an unusual, uh, fish biologist in that I, I never grew up fishing. Uh, it was just not something that, uh, you know, my parents weren't terribly interested in, uh, fish are just kind of slimy, uninteresting, unintelligent, uh, creatures. And then I went to Dalhousie university and I took a course on fish biology with, uh, Dr. Jeff Hutchings, who, um, you, you may have never heard of him. I'm not sure he was on CBC from time to time. Uh, but he was a real advocate for uh, the fish and uh, just helped me develop a real love for these creatures that they they have social systems, they have parenting styles, they uh, have unique forms of communication. You know, they hide under the water, they're hard to find, they're hard to see, uh, but they are just as, to my mind, as compelling as the birds and the mammals and the reptiles and amphibians that we uh, care about. Um, so what I'd like to do tonight is take you through uh, Alberta's freshwater fish uh, diversity. And I'd like you to take notes, get a pen and paper ready. Uh, we're going to go through some stuff dealing with Alberta's fish diversity. I'm going to take you through some tips on how to identify uh, fish to the family level. And we'll have opportunities to practice throughout the presentation. And at the end, I'm going to show you a photo of a fish I haven't shown you yet. You tell me which family it belongs to. Send me an email to matthew.morris at ambrose.edu and I'll do a random draw of those who got it right and uh, uh, the winner will receive a free Alberta Fishes Guide in the mail. Hopefully, well, probably not in time for Christmas, but uh, soon thereafter, I, I hope. Now, if you were to uh, ever find yourself up by Caroline, there's a couple lakes not too far apart from one another on the road there, uh, Ironside Lake and Alfred Lake. And if you were to take some minnow traps, like the one shown here, um, and, and it really doesn't take much work. Uh, when I was out at uh, one of these lakes, I had a minnow trap. I was dragging it through the water to get it to where I wanted to set it. And when I pulled the trap up to set it in the water, it was already full of fish. But if you were to do this, you, you would find some really unique members of Alberta's fish diversity in these lakes. In Ironside Lake, you'd find these little tiny minnows uh, called the Northern Red Belly Dace, also shown at the top here, with two sort of little black side stripes on them. If you were to go to Alfred Lake, you would find the fine scale dace, shown at the bottom here, has just one stripe on it. Uh, these fish look very similar to one another, tiny little details that, that help us separate them, but the males during the breeding season can be really gorgeous with bright, vibrant reds uh, or yellows uh, on their side, as you can maybe kind of make out on this one fish here. But you would also find something sort of unusual in these lakes. In both Ironside Lake and Alfred Lake, you would find uh, a hybrid shown in the middle here. A hybrid is a, a, a product of the mating of two distinct species. In this case, Northern Red Belly and, and Fine Scale Dace have mated to produce a hybrid. The interesting thing is that there are no Fine Scale Dace in Ironside Lake, and there are no Northern Red Belly Dace in Alfred Lake. So where do these hybrids come from? Well, it turns out these hybrids are the product of an ancient uh, hybridization event that likely happened during the last glaciation. Um, 
from that point, these hybrids have persisted uh, in uh, indefinite. So, so hybridization is not a constantly occurring thing. It happened possibly once, uh, maybe 10,000 years ago or so, uh, when fish were kind of crowded into these the, the few little remaining lakes uh, during that glaciation. And they hybridize. And these hybrids are really weird. They're really fascinating because what these hybrids do, uh, you would find there are only females found in these lakes. There are no male hybrids. So how do the females persist? They need a male of the northern red belly or fine scaled ace. They will initiate sort of reproductive behaviors. The male will uh, release sperm to fertilize those eggs. But here's the wild thing. The sperm touches the egg, but it doesn't penetrate. There's no genuine fertilization that occurs. What the egg is waiting for is the protein from the, the, the sperm head. And that activates eugenesis and produces a female. So what we have here, this sort of nondescript looking fish in the middle, this hybrid fish, um, it, it's a clone. It propagates itself clonally by parasitizing the sperm of either of its parental species. This process is called gynogenesis. It's quite rare um, in the animal world. We see it in a handful of fish across uh, the world and some species of lizards, for instance. But here we have them just outside of Caroline in Alberta. Now, if you were to... Uh, investigate Alberta's fish biodiversity. If you were to look at checklists of the creatures that inhabit this province, you're not going to find the hybrid on there. Hybrids uh, don't typically count when it comes to biodiversity. And yet, uh, here's this creature living its own sort of unique evolutionary and ecological uh, history, playing this out over and over again in our lakes. Now, I uh, first became uh, aware of Alberta's freshwater fish diversity. I'm from Ontario, not from Alberta. I had to do some uh, digging to figure out what lives around here uh, during my PhD in the lab of Dr. Sean Rogers at the University of Calgary. I'd gone to the bookstore one day looking for uh, something for my wife, and I came across this folding pocket guide of Calgary birds uh, done up by um, Waterford Press. And I thought, wouldn't that be amazing if we had one of these for Alberta's freshwater fish? And so I contacted them, and they were interested. Turns out the founder uh, James Cavanaugh uh, was, was actually from Alberta, even though their office is down in Florida. And so Dr. Rogers and I uh, started digging into the literature to figure out, okay, what actually lives in this province? What fish are found here? And it turned out it was hard to pin down that number. There were all sorts of competing uh, estimates of Alberta's freshwater fish diversity. So we had to make some decisions about what would go into our guide and, and what wouldn't. And that's in part what I'd like to talk about today. Now, I haven't just made guides for Alberta. You can also find them for Ontario and Saskatchewan and British Columbia. You can get these in chapters. Uh, and we're starting a, a series for the states now. I have Idaho and Montana, North and South Carolina, Minnesota, and Texas. The rest of Canada should be uh, published next year. So if you're at all interested, you can look those up. Now, of course, compiling this information uh, you know, I'm not going out to all the lakes and identify. I'm not doing the, the the groundwork here. A lot of this groundwork was pioneered by uh, uh, real giants in the field, from Scott and Crossman's amazing Freshwater Fishes of Canada book to um, Nelson and Pates's Fishes of Alberta, second edition from 1992, published by the University of Alberta. Uh, these people did a lot of the legwork, and what I'm presenting tonight is a lot of compiling of work that others have done. So tonight, what I'd like to do is ask a couple of questions about Alberta's fish biodiversity. First, why should we care? Secondly, what actually is out there so far as we can tell? Third, why are those estimates always changing? If there's time, because I do have a lot packed in here, why are there so few species in Alberta? Why can I actually cover this all in one uh, session? You know, if we tried to do this for birds, we'd be here all night. And finally, how can you help? Now, in ecology, we talk a lot about what are called ecosystem services. Uh, this was popularized a few decades ago as a means to talk to stakeholders, banks, industry about why ecosystems matter. Uh, and people have broken down ecosystem services into four components. These are things that ecosystems do that benefit us. Okay, An ecosystem service is what an ecosystem does that benefits humans. And they've broken those down into supporting, regulating, provisioning, and cultural services. Fish uh, provide services to us Albertans. We should care about Alberta's fish biodiversity selfishly. I think there are non-selfish reasons to care about them, but there are good selfish reasons to care about Alberta's fish biodiversity. Things like 
uh, how they support all the other processes that uh, go on in ecosystems. For instance, they indicate habitat quality. Right? We have little minnows called fathead minnows that uh, help us understand when waters are becoming sort of poisoned, or long-nosed dace that help us understand when hormone uh, levels are getting too high uh, near wastewater treatment plants here in the Bow River. Right? They help us understand ecosystem health. I've also put genetic resources on here because we need wild populations of fish with an abundance of genetic variation in order to foster future aquaculture efforts. We have what are called regulating services. Uh, these are the things that ecosystems do uh, to regulate um, parts of the environment that matter to us, things like keeping water clean. Some fish uh, actually help uh, with water quality by limiting invasive species that would uh, create turbidity in the water. So they help with things like biological control, keeping invasive species away. And there's some really interesting studies on carbon sequestration in fish. Fish uh, consume carbon-based bodies, that carbon dioxide comes from the air, it gets absorbed into the water, uh, taken up into small cells, the fish eat it, and then they expel that carbon as these pellets that are heavy and they sink to the bottom of the lake or the bottom of the ocean where they're then trapped for uh, maybe hundreds to thousands to tens of thousands of years. Uh, so fish can be a really important component of the carbon cycle, uh, regulating global climate. Most obviously, there are provisioning services, right? Fish give us food. I'm not sure if any of you have ever eaten our local fish, um, but certainly our indigenous neighbors um, uh, rely on uh, fish as food, um, particularly in northern Alberta. We also use them as fertilizer. We use them as uh, pet food, right, to keep our cats and dogs going. So. Um, some of the fish in this province would get sold uh, for pet food and canned and shipped elsewhere throughout the world. And then there's all the cultural services that fish provide, uh, those sort of intangible things that uh, are hard to sort of describe or put a monetary value on, but they're important nonetheless. Things like, you know, the joy of having pet fish or all the jobs that are fostered in Alberta through the research of our fishes. Or uh, provincial pride, we have a national fish, or a provincial fish, that's what you're seeing here. This is the bull trout, right? Our, 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 the fish that gives us a sense of, yes, we are Albertans and this is our fish. Uh, ecotourism, the money that people spend to go off to Banff and Jasper, they go buy lattes and they go fishing, right? In the mountains for amazing fish. And so all the money that comes in because of our fish, the psychological well-being that uh, fishing can afford. And there are spiritual practices that revolve around uh, fish for a variety of different people groups. And this is just a, like off the top of my head, some of the things that Alberta's fish provide for us. Good reasons to care, besides the fact that they're just gorgeous, amazing, interesting creatures in their own right. So what I'd like to do is take you through sort of whirlwind tour of Alberta's freshwater fish diversity. Uh, I'm gonna introduce you to 65 different species of fish 19 different families. We're going to really focus on the family level. So grab your pen, grab your paper, jot down a few quick notes, and we'll see uh, how you do. In order to recognize Alberta's freshwater fish diversity, you need to know something about their fins. If you can remember their fins and where the fins are located, you're three quarters of the way to figuring out what kind of fish you're looking at. So fish have what are called median fins. Median fins are single fins located on the sort of median uh, part of their body. So we have the dorsal fin that's located right on the back. Some fish have a second dorsal fin. Uh, in this case, this is an, called an adipose fin. The adipose fin is a little semicircle that lacks uh, skeletal elements. So as the dorsal fin, you can sort of see in there these little fin rays. We don't have those on the adipose fin. It's just tissue. And they have a caudal fin, or sometimes called the tail fin. And on the, um, underneath, on their belly, they have the anal fin. These are all median fins. There's only one of them. Then they have two sets of what are called paired fins. These are equivalent to their arms and their legs. We have the pectoral fin, which is equivalent to the arms, and the pelvic fin, which is equivalent to their legs. Okay. So the things you want to pay attention to. How many dorsal fins do they have? Do they have an adipose fin or not? Where is the dorsal fin relative to the adipo or the anal fin? Is the dorsal fin right over the anal fin or is it more towards the center of the back? Where are the pectoral and pelvic fins in respect to one another? 
sometimes you get these fish where their legs and their arms are all scrunched up right by the head and others the the legs as it were the pelvic fins are quite far away from the head here's just another example um john i guess i should stop and just make sure you guys can hear me and you can see these slides okay right nothing's covered over uh yes um i can we can certainly hear you very well and as I, the slides are perfect for for us. The, yeah, the the little um, view of you up in the right hand corner might block off uh, a little bit here and there. Okay, I'll see if I can move that out of the way. Maybe I don't know if that helps or not. Okay, so here we have um, we have a yellow perch, and this is a fish that has two dorsal fins. And notice that the second dorsal fin has skeletal elements. So this is not an adipose fin. Adipose fins are tiny little semicircles. For some fish that have two dorsal fins, the first dorsal fin has these spines. If you've ever picked up a yellow perch and it's sort of erected its first fin, it can stab you with these sharp little bones that it has up here um, called spines. Whereas the second fin is what we call a soft rayed fin. It, it, its skeletal elements are quite pliable and, and gentle. Here again, we have the anal fin and the caudal fin, and we have our pectoral and pelvic fins, but this time they're sort of scrunched up by the head with a lot of body after the pelvic fins. So with that said, I'm gonna take you through some sort of keys for uh, understanding uh, the families of fish that we have in the province. But first, I just wanna point out the conservation status of these fish. You'll see as, as, as we go through the presentation, you're going to see species names and those species names are gonna be color coded and the color coding corresponds to their conservation status in Alberta. So if you see as a dark blue, that's like, oh, peaceful, gentle, these, these species are secure. And you can see most of our species fit in this category. Then if it's light blue, we're getting into, we think they're secure, but there's some uncertainty in our knowledge. When it's yellow, that's where we've hit the sort of caution mark. These are vulnerable species that if we don't intervene, um, could have some troubles in the future. In orange are species that are imperiled, which means they're on the brink of becoming endangered. And those in red are critically imperiled, which means we need to pull out the stops now if we wish to uh, maintain them in the province. Those are in sort of dull, boring gray, means we don't know anything about them. We, we don't know enough about them to assess their status and those that are in green are introduced. So this is the conservation status of all of Alberta's fishes. This is the conservation status nationally, uh, Canada-wide for the same species. So what you can see is that Canada-wide, most of the fish found in Alberta are doing just fine, but in Alberta itself, they're in some trouble. Okay, so look for that color coding as, as I go on. Okay, so here's where you want your notes. I'm going to take you through the 19 different families that are found in the province with some tips and tricks, and then we'll test out your knowledge. So first, we have fish with a single dorsal fin, and that dorsal fin is found more towards the center of the body. The first big family we have in the province are the suckers. So notice here, with the sucker, we have one dorsal fin in the center of the body. We have a nice forked tail. Our pelvic and pectoral fins are widely spaced. And with the suckers, they have a, their mouth is towards the bottom of their head, and it's sucker-like. Thankfully, all of Alberta's suckers have sucker-like mouths. There are a few suckers that don't that you'd find in other Canadian provinces, namely the buffalo, but we don't have those in Alberta. So any sucker that you see is going to have a sucker-like mouth. We also have uh, some goldfish-appearing uh, creatures. Fish that look like goldfish, they belong to the carp family. Notice we have one dorsal fin. Now, in this case, the dorsal fin can be quite long. One dorsal fin, forked caudal fin, uh, and they look essentially like a goldfish. We have the East Asian carps. These fish can be quite large. Again, we have one dorsal fin in the middle of the body, forked caudal fin. These fish can be quite large with great big scales, um, but you're almost never going to see them. You'll find these guys in community lakes. I'll talk more about those in a moment. And then we have the true minnows with, again, the dorsal fin, one dorsal fin in the middle of the body, forked caudal fin. Now notice these three groups, the carps, the East Asian carps, and the true minnows, they all have forward-facing mouths, whereas the suckers have their mouth on the underside. So if you see one dorsal fin, 
you know it's either a sucker if it's got a sucker mouth or it's one of these three groups now not too long ago these three groups all belonged to one family so it was nice and easy they were all saprinids but recent genetic work has revealed that these are actually three distinct families the carps the east asian carps and the true minnows and so now now we have our work cut out for us in distinguishing them but most of our species belong to this true minnow group if you see a single dorsal fin, but that dorsal fin is towards the back of the body, positioned above the anal fin towards the tail, it could be one of these creatures. We have the sturgeons. Now, there's not much else in the province like a sturgeon. These are hard to uh, get wrong. The sturgeons are sort of shark-like. Here's their one dorsal fin located over their anal fin. We have a forked caudal fin, but the upper lobe is shark-like. It's longer than the lower lobe. We have these little bony plates on their back, and there's some more on the side and some more on the belly sometimes. And we have a downward facing mouth with little whiskers, little barbels, we call them, on the bottom of the mouth. There's very little in the province like a sturgeon. Then we have the moon eyes. Again, you see one dorsal fin positioned over the anal fin, forked caudal fin. And the body of these guys, they're, they're very silvery, and they look kind of like a pancake, but so if you put the pancake up so it was facing you, we call this laterally compressed. Their bodies are not wide, they're sort of squished together. Then we have the pikes. Again, dorsal fin over the anal fin. The pelvic and pectoral fins are widely spaced. These guys have long torpedo-shaped bodies with a duck-like snout. Again, it's very hard to confuse a pike for anything else. And finally, we have the live bearers. Notice the live bearers, their dorsal fin again is over their anal fin. They have a rounded caudal fin instead of forked. Their mouth is located right at the top. It's upwardly pointed because they're typically eating things at the surface of the water. And what's really cool about the live bearers is that the males have this long modified uh, fin that they insert into the uh, female and the sperm gets guided down that fin into the female and she's internally fertilized and then she gives birth to live babies if you've ever had guppies as a pet you'll know guppies belong to this group and that's it for creatures in this province that have one dorsal fin now there are some that have two dorsal fins but the second fin doesn't have those skeletal supports it's an adipose fin so if you see a fish with an adipose fin here's the adipose fin that tiny little semicircle fin and it has eight barbels like whiskers these are our catfish it's again really hard to confuse a catfish for something else if you see the adipose fin but the pectoral and pelvic fins are widely spaced apart you're looking at a salmonid one of our white fishes trouts or salmons and if you see that little adipose fin but this time the pelvic and pectoral fins overlap you're looking at what's called a trout perch and trout perch and salmon are only confused when they're tiny, when you're looking at a baby trout, but trout perch don't get very large. So we only have three groups of fish in the province with these adipose fins, very easy to tell them apart. Okay, everybody's doing okay so far. You, you've taken good notes. These are, uh, what do we have? Eight, nine, 10, 11 of our 19 families. So now we have fish that have two dorsal fins but both of those fins are soft. In other words, the skeletal structures uh, don't have spines. There are only two groups in the province like this, and the one you will never confuse, it's the lampreys. Lampreys have these vicious circular mouths that suction on to uh, the sides of fish, and uh, at least for the parasitic species, and, and sort of scrape away at the fish. Now, you're never going to see one of these in the province. They've only ever been found up at the Northwest Territories border. And that was only once, and it was only babies, and it was in the 1980s. They haven't been seen since. So you're probably not going to see these guys. The other possibility are the burbots. And the burbots are sort of eel-like fish, very long, rounded tail fin instead of forked, a tiny little first dorsal fin, a very long second dorsal fin. And their pectoral and pelvic fins are located close together and they have a barbel under their chin, just one little sort of chin whisker, a little beard as it were. So it's hard to confuse a burbot for anything else. Now we get to the groups that are a little bit more confusing perhaps. Two dorsal fins, but the first fin is spiny. First we have the sculpins. Sculpins have two, you see these two dorsal fins, 
the first one has some some sort of weak spines. They're probably not going to stab you uh, too bad, but they're present. They have a, a huge depressed head for their tiny little bodies, and they have a giant, you can't see it in the shade here, but a giant fan-like pectoral fin. There's another group that's similar. Again, this group used to be in the same family as the sculpins, but genetic work has recently separated them. This is our blobfish equivalent. If you've ever seen those weird pictures of the fish that sort of collapsed with its nose hanging over. If you don't know what a blobfish is, look it up. They're crazy weird. Um, the deep water sculpin are in the same family. But again, you're never going to see one of these. You find them at like 80 some meters depth in uh, Waterton Lake. And then we have our perch. Again, a spiny fin and a soft fin, clearly separated from one another with a rounded or forked caudal fin. Okay, then you're looking at our perches. If you find a fish that has one dorsal fin way back over its anal fin, but it has these spines, those spines are actually a second, or, or sorry, the first dorsal fin, but the membrane has disappeared. All they have left are the skeletal elements. They don't actually have a fin anymore. These are the sticklebacks. They'll lay their spines uh, against their back and then they stick them up and lock them into place when they're trying to defend themselves. Also, weirdly, they've lost the equivalent of their legs. Instead of legs, they have these little pectoral, uh, or sorry, little pelvic spines. They don't have an actual fin there. And the spines, too, they can lock out. It gives them this nice sort of three-dimensional um, spiny structure that intimidates would-be predators. So if you see that, those are the sticklebacks. The final two groups are groups you're probably never going to see. The basses have a spiny and a soft dorsal fin, but they're merged together. They're, they're connected together. Uh, you only find them in Island Lake. And even then, I'm not sure that they still exist. There were reproducing populations in there introduced a long time ago, but no word as to whether they're still found. And finally, we have the cichlids, which also have a spiny and a soft fin, but they're so fused together that you can barely tell where one begins and the other ends. Again, the cichlids you'll likely see in pet stores, in the grocery store, but you probably will never see in the natural world. Okay, so you got it. So we got one dorsal fin towards the center of the body, one dorsal fin over the anal fin, two dorsal fins, but the second is the adipose fin, two dorsal fins where they're both soft, or two dorsal fins where the first one is spiny. So let's see how you do. You got your pen and paper at home. You've taken your notes. I'm going to show you some pictures. You don't have to type anything into chat or anything like this. Just like talk amongst yourself and see if you can figure this out. Here's the first fish. Let's take a look at its defining features. We see some barbels under its snout. We have this weird shark-like caudal fin. We have a dorsal fin right over the anal fin. What do you suppose this creature is? Well, if you guessed the sturgeon, you'd be absolutely right. Oh, and we had someone right in the chat bar. Let's see. Ah, yeah, Linda, you're absolutely right. Well done. A sturgeon. These are members of the family Acipinceridae. There's quite a few species um, in Canada, but the only one we have in Alberta is the lake sturgeon. Uh, and even their numbers are not doing so well. That's why you see it listed in red here. They're considered critically imperiled in the province. But there is nothing else like them uh, here in Alberta. Our largest uh, freshwater fish. And thinking of cultural services, we have locations named after these, right? We have the Sturgeon River. Okay, here's a fish. We have a, a silvery body with great big scales. We have one dorsal fin oriented over the anal fin, forked caudal fin. And if you're to look at this thing on the side, it would be flattened like a pancake. What do you suppose this belongs to? Oh yeah, let's see, we have someone in the chat here. Ah, we got a moon eye, yeah. Anyone else wanna take a stab at it? Let's do five seconds. Five, four, three, Two, one. Okay, let's take a look. Absolutely, Linda, you are totally right. That is a moon eye. So we have two species of moon eyes in the province. They belong to the family Hyodontidae. And our two species are the moon eye and the gold eye. 
And if you want, I mean, this is sort of extra detail, but if you wanted to tell the difference, because they look very similar, if you were to draw a line from the beginning of the anal fin up, for a moon eye, that line's going to cross through the dorsal fin, or maybe be right at the start of the dorsal fin. But if it's a gold eye, you draw that from the beginning of the anal fin up, there's a big gap before the dorsal fin begins. So if any of you are avid fishermen, this is the way to tell those two apart. Interestingly, we didn't know that moon eye existed in this province until the 1970s. They were consistently being confused with gold eye. Okay, here's the next one. We have a single dorsal fin. Uh, we have a sucker-like mouth. What do you suppose uh, this uh, these, these two fellows are? Uh, not too hard to find out, I don't think. Yeah, these are suckers. Of course, these are suckers. In the family Catastomidae, we have seven species of sucker in the province. So our suckers belong to a couple different groups. We have uh, the Catastomus group, the long nose sucker up above here, and the white sucker down below. The white suckers have larger scales. And we have, and very rarely found, the large scale sucker. We also have one member of the genus Pentasteus, uh, which previously was a Catastomus, but recent genetic work has separated it. Um, so now BC has one species and we have the other, and ours is called the plain sucker. Unlike our catastomus, where the lips are nice and smooth all around, um, the plain sucker has this notch where the two lips meet. Then we have our red horses. We have two species of red horse in the province, the short head and the silver. Again, this yellow indicates that the silver red horse is listed as vulnerable. And we have this beauty, the quillback, so named for its really long uh, front dorsal fin ray. Okay, here's another fish. We got this one dorsal fin, um, quite long. And it looks kind of like something you might find at the pet store. What do you suppose uh, this fish, what group this fish belongs to? Mm, we have forward facing mouth, one dorsal fin. Yeah, this is where things get maybe a little more challenging. This is a carp or one of the carps. This is actually a goldfish. But yeah, this is a carp-like fish, right? This belongs to the family Ciprinidae, um, or sometimes called the Old World minnows. And we have two species of them in the province. Both of them are introduced. We have the goldfish, people's pets that they released, and we have the wild ancestor of the goldfish. Alberta's claim to fame is currently being the only province in Canada with uh, Prussian carp. And I'll talk more about the Prussian carp uh, later. But you can see they look very similar to one another. A little bit of difference in the sheen, but uh, it's really, really hard to tell them apart um, using uh, external morphology. Yeah, you often need to count things like gill rakers to tell them apart. Okay, here again, we have one dorsal fin in the center of the body. Great big scales, huge body. Um, what do you suppose this belongs to? Now, if any of you have gone fishing in some of our community lakes, you may have encountered one of these. This is a really interesting part of Alberta's fauna because it, it doesn't actually belong here. This is the family Xenocypridae, or the East Asian minnows. We have one species represented here, uh, the grass carp, which was introduced as a form of biocontrol to our lakes. They, they eat uh, plant matter. Now, they make millions of eggs and nobody wants them escaping and, and generating a self-sustaining population. So the ones that are purchased for the province are triploid. Uh, that means they have three copies of every chromosome, which makes them effectively sterile. So they have to continually be stocked. We don't have any naturally reproducing grass carp in the province, at least so far as we know. Okay, we have this fish, forward-facing mouth, dorsal fin over the center. What do you suppose this one is? Yeah, this is a member of the true minnows, the true minnows. Uh, the family Lachiscidae. This is one of the most biodiverse species in the province. We have 14 species and counting. So here, uh, I'm not going to go through details on all these guys, but here you can see most of our uh, minnow diversity. We have the lake chub at the top, emerald shiners, which you might have purchased frozen down at Little Bow to go fishing for walleye, uh, fathead minnows, which are bioindicator species, and long-nosed dace, which are also bioindicators. If you're out in the bow ever in Calgary, these are the fish most likely coming up to you and nibbling on your toes. Uh, river shiners and brassy minnows, northern pearl dace and spot tail shiners, red side shiners and western silvery minnows, and then our two dace, the um, northern red belly and the fine scale. 
our minnows are doing fairly well overall. You notice the Western silvery is in red because it is considered critically imperiled, but the others are doing okay. We also have two enormous true minnows, the Northern Pike minnow and the flathead chub. You can catch these uh, when you're fishing. Northern Pike minnow is the largest minnow in Canada. And you can go find it in places like Peace River. Okay, what do we have here? We got two dorsal fins. You can sort of see the one median fin here, and then there's the tiny little adipose fin. And we got some nice whiskers. So the whiskers here let you know that this is a catfish. This is a member of the family Ictaluridae. Yeah, thanks for, uh, I appreciate you guys are playing. Um, we, we have two uh, species in the province, maybe. This one is a stone cat. You find these only in the southern bit of, of the province in um, the Milk River area. If you find a catfish anywhere else, notify the government immediately because they don't belong there. In fact, in 2015, there was a big sort of uproar because black bullhead were found breeding up in a little pond in Fort McMurray. They found multiple generations of the black bullhead living up there. They're not native to the province. They shouldn't have been there. The government responded quickly. Um, so far as I know, they've been eliminated, but you, you never quite know with these things. So I'll give it a couple more years before I take them off the list. Okay, here we have one dorsal fin situated over the back of the fish, what do you suppose this thing is? Long torpedo-shaped body, duck-like snout. Yeah, these are pike. They belong to the family Isacidae, and we only have one species of pike in the province. You can find more in other Canadian provinces. Um, our species is the northern pike. This is the adult at the bottom with the little bean-like markings. The juveniles look quite different with these sort of vertical banding patterns, but they're both northern pike. Okay, here we have one dorsal fin. We have this little tiny uh, adipose fin and our pins are widely spaced. What does this belong to? Now these are our second most biodiverse group in the province, the Salmonids, the family Salmonidae. We have 15 species in the province and counting. They're broken up into a couple different groups. We have the white fishes, which are uh, economically extremely important, especially for places like Lesser Slave Lake. Uh, we have things like the cisco up top and the lake white fish. We also have the short jaw cisco, which you'll probably never see. It's uh, got quite a restricted distribution in the province. Here in Calgary, you will see lots of the top right here, the um, mountain white fish in the genus Prosopium, but you'll probably never see the other members, the pygmy white fish, and the round white fish. In the northern part of the province, we have Arctic grayling, which are absolutely stunningly gorgeous fish with these great big sail-like dorsal fins. And then we have our Pacific trouts, the rainbow trout, the golden trout, and the cutthroat trout. You'll notice I have two colors here. The rainbow trout are native to Alberta, where they are listed as imperiled, um, but they're only found in the Athabasca River and they're quite small. Uh, and not things you'd really be uh, interested in fishing. And then I have them in green to reflect the fact that the rest of our rainbow trout come from California. Similarly, our cutthroat trout, we have two subspecies in the province, the West Slope cutthroat trout, which is, which is sorry, imperiled in the province, and the Yellowstone cutthroat trout, which is introduced. Then we have our chars. Uh, we have our brook trout and our provincial fish, the bull trout, which can be just an enormous beast of a fish and our lake trout, um, as well as an introduced population of Dolly Varden. And then we have our Atlantic salmons. We don't actually have Atlantic salmon in the province. We did at one point. Um, these are brown trout, uh, which were introduced from Europe. So here we have uh, a brown trout at the bottom here. And this is the juvenile. Okay, moving along. Here we have one dorsal fin and a tiny little adipose fin. But notice that the pectoral and pelvic fins overlap. There's very little like this in the province. This is a trout perch. Um, we do have them around Calgary. They're small bodied, translucent, large mouthed fish. Really weird. There are only two members in this family, in this, in, in fact, in the order per, uh, Percopsiforms in, in all of North America. It's kind of an enigmatic, unusual little fish. Okay, now we have this guy, long snake like body, two dorsal fins. The first one's quite small, the second's quite long, rounded caudal fin. 
These guys are the burbits. We have a single species of burbit. They used to be considered a freshwater cod in the family Gadidae, but they've been recently moved to their own family Lottidae. Oh, I didn't put down the species information here. I'm sorry about that. But I, I believe they're considered secure in the province. Okay, now we have two fins. First is spiny, second is soft, and they're merged together such that you, you have a hard time telling the two apart. These are our cichlids. We only have one species of cichlid in the province, and it's actually not the one shown here. Uh, we have jewelfish living in the hot springs in Banff, although they haven't been seen since probably the year 2000. The other member I have on here is the plus one is the Nile tilapia, which you can find in grocery stores. And ha they have been pulled out of the bow, but there's no evidence that they persist or are reproducing. It's just a sort of a one-off uh, escape. And okay, now we have one dorsal fin and this weird modified anal fin. These guys are the live bearers. And we have two species present in the province, the Western mosquito fish and the sailfin molly both introduced by aquarium enthusiasts and found only in the cave and basin uh, out in, uh, near Banff. Um, but lots of people take pictures of these and upload them to iNaturalist because they're so just so bizarre. These are uh, warm water fish. They shouldn't be here, but they thrive in our uh, hot springs. Okay, now we have two dorsal fins. The first is spiny and the second is soft, clearly disconnected. Any thoughts about what you're seeing here? I guess I showed you this picture before. Yeah, these, these are members of the perch and darters, the family Percidae. We have five species in the province, the walleye. This is a picture of the first fish my son ever caught. It was this uh, summer. He went fishing for about two minutes and he caught this beautiful walleye down in Little Bow. We have yellow perch and we have sauger. So some uh, economically important fish in the province, as well as some smaller members, the darters. You can see two, um, two dorsal fins separated a rounded or forked caudal fin, tiny little mouth, right? the Iowa darter and the log perch. What do you suppose we have here? These are our sticklebacks, family gastrostatae. We have three species in this group. And you can tell the first fin is essentially gone. It's lost all of its membranes. It's just the skeletal support. And then there's another little dorsal fin in behind. And here's those nasty little uh, leg replacements, the pelvic spines. We have three species in the province. The brook sticklebacks, the one you're likely to see. Um, the nine spine stickleback, I haven't actually found in the province. This one it was from Alaska. And we have an introduced, possibly, population of three spine sticklebacks living in Edmonton. Uh, this one you see here was captured in um, uh, Maliwan stormwater drainage pond. And I took a picture because stickleback males usually develop a bright red throat, but this one's was black. We find that in a few populations on the West Coast. It's extremely rare uh, and happens in particularly turbid water where they've adapted to those uh, dark colored waters. So this deserves further follow-up as to why our introduced population has such a weird phenotype. You know, we have a large depressed head, two dorsal fins. The first is weakly spiny, and we have this big, huge sail-like pectoral fin. These are our sculpins. We have five species of sculpin in the province. The prickly sculpin, which is a new discovery. Um, this was found actually by members of the Rogers Lab at the University of Calgary residing up in the Peace River. Nobody, it was sort of suspected they might be in the province, but it had never been confirmed um, until uh, just a few years ago. Spoonhead sculpin, which you can find down here uh, in Calgary, and the slimy sculpin. Down in the Milk River, there's another species that has yet to be described. We, we don't know what its name is going to be. Um, so it's just called Cottus species. The CF means um, it looks like Cottus bairdii, the modeled sculpin, but it's not. And then we have our deep water friend, a really bizarre blobfish relative. And the two other creatures that you probably won't see are the Arctic lamprey and the smallmouth bass, both of which it's an open question whether they still persist in the province. 
Now we've been keeping track of Alberta's diversity. That was 65 species I just walked you through. We've been keeping track of Alberta's diversity since 1895 when Carl Eigenman did one of the first published surveys of fish. He went out to Medicine Hat in Calgary and Banff and identified a variety of species, including things that don't exist, like the gray sucker, and species that have never been found in the province, like Carpiotes velifer uh, found here, or, or shown here. And if you look at the different studies that have been done on Alberta's freshwater fish diversity, you see it changes over time. Estimates in the early days were quite low, but even you get to 1992, and there's no consensus on how many fish species live here. An average of 65 species that I showed you, but a standard deviation of 6.4. Why the discrepancy? Here, I know this is hard to see, but going back in time, 111 different species of fish have been claimed to be found in our waters. These red bars indicate how long they persist on our species lists. If we sort of zoom in, you can see way back in 1919, a white sturgeon was listed as found in the province and the people immediately dropped it from our list. It was clearly a misidentification. And there's more interesting ones like American eel persisted on lists between 1979 and 2001. Long-nosed suckers have been on this list from 1895 to the, the present day. In fact, there are 12 species consistently listed in the province between 1895 and today. The, the white and long-nosed suckers, the mountain whitefish, the lake trout, the rainbow trout, fathead minnow, flathead chub, long-nosed dace, northern pike, trout perch, brook stickleback, and the walleye. Everything else has sort of come and gone in our lists since they were first developed. So why are they dropping out? So I'll just sort of end today with this uh, very brief reflection. First, we have a lot of misidentifications, and I'm guilty of them myself. My The first edition of the Alberta Freshwater Guide listed Crucian carp as uh, introduced in the province. They never existed here. It was a misidentification of a Prussian carp. So we retracted that in the second edition of our guide. But for a time there, it made it on a list. We thought they were present. Similarly, in some of the early reports, we have things like blackfin cisco being listed that were simply misidentified uh, ciscos. Our diversity increases as we get new discoveries. We find new species uh, that have been native to Alberta this whole time. Things like this Rocky Mountain sculpin down in the Milk River doesn't yet have a scientific name. It's genetically unique. We're still figuring out what this thing is. In 2022, we're finding new species in the province. Or as I mentioned, the moon eye wasn't found until 1974 in the province. Hard to manage a recreationally important fish when you're confusing two species for one. There's also interesting questions about what is actually worthy of naming, what belongs in our measures of biodiversity. This is the Banff long-nosed dace. This is a subspecies of long-nosed dace that was restricted to the hot springs in Alberta and was found nowhere else in the world. It was found in Banff and that's it. It went extinct, well, probably driven extinct by the introduction of uh, some non-native uh, tropical fish. Should we include extinct species as members of our biodiversity or not? Different people have different opinions on this. What about subspecies? There are genetically and economically important subspecies present in the province. Should, are these worthy of naming? Should we list the Athabasca rainbow trout on our list as something separate from the introduced Californian uh, rainbow trout? If all we have is rainbow trout on our list, we have a biodiversity of one for rainbow trout. It misses some of these subtleties that there is both a, a genetically distinct native group present in the province and uh, these introduced uh, creatures. There's also differences in opinion about what a species is. We have what are called lumpers and splitters. If a lumpers written your account, you're going to have fewer species on it. They think phenotypically distinct populations belong together as one species. Splitters like to separate them. So with our cutthroat trout, I mentioned we have West Slope and Yellowstone cutthroat trout. That counts as one member on our biodiversity list. But according to Eschmeyer's catalog of fishes, West Slope cutthroat trout should be renamed to Oncorhynchus lewisii, its own species distinct from that of the Yellowstone cutthroat trout Oncorhynchus virginalis. So who do you side with here is going to depend on, or is going to sort of determine the number of species present in the province. Should we think about notable hybrids? Should they be included on our list? This is a rainbow trout, cutthroat trout hybrid called the cutbow. Uh, they, th they threaten the persistence of our native West Slope cutthroats. Should we consider them? They're recreationally important. 
Tiger trout are one of the latest additions to the province. This is a brown trout brook trout hybrid. Should we add them to our list? They're hybrids. They're not technically uh, species, but some people add them and some don't. And if you add them, where do you stop? Because there's lots of subspecies of minnows found in the province as well. What about notable variants? This is a rosy red minnow. It's actually just a fathead minnow with a color mutation, but this is not a wild uh, red, rosy red minnow. The rosy reds are found in pet stores. Somebody released this into Fish Creek Park this summer. My son found it. Uh, but these are big problems in British Columbia. BC, they're, they're persisting in the wild. They're mating. The government's trying to eliminate them. They will count them as an important aspect of biodiversity. And how long since a fish was last seen should it be included on a list? The, the jewel fish, as far as I know, hasn't been seen since the year 2000. Arctic lampreys haven't been seen since the 1980s, but they still show up on our measures of biodiversity. Should we continue to keep them there? You also find changes to our biodiversity over time as people introduce fish to the province and those fish don't persist. Uh, guppies and convict cichlids uh, and sword tails have been added to the Banff Hot Springs, but they eventually died out. There was a time where you could go to the Glenmore Reservoir and catch Atlantic salmon, uh, or sorry, uh, catch kokanee. Atlantic salmon were introduced to Jasper and Banff. They persisted for a time. People caught them. They got added to our biodiversity lists, but ultimately they fizzled out. But other introduced species have done quite well. The brown trout, oh geez, probably 100 years ago or so by now, uh, there was a driver taking brown trout over to the national park in the mountains. His truck broke down. Uh, his trout were going to die. He saw a creek nearby. He dumped them into that creek, and brown trout have been in the province ever since. We just added a species to our biodiversity. The Prussian carp are, of course, the big invaders these days. Uh, really weird uh, creatures. They are gynogenetic, like those hybrid dace I, I began with. Uh, so all you need is one female. And if there is another minnow, like a fathead minnow in the water, when its sperm is sort of floating around in the water and it contacts a Prussian carp egg, bam, we have clonal Prussian carp. These have taken over uh, so many of our waterways in southern Alberta and are likely a permanent member of Alberta's biodiversity. So the final consideration is the fact that we live in an urban center that has a stunning amount of freshwater fish biodiversity. It's just they're not in the wild, they're kept in our homes. And urban ecologists are starting to find this uh, kind of interesting because there are socioeconomic factors at play that determine what sorts of freshwater fishes can be found in particular areas. In July 2015, I went to two pet stores in Calgary and found over 450 species of fish, which is so much higher than what you'll find in the entirety of the province. Now, I said if there was time, I'd talk about why it's so low, but I don't think we have time. So let me get to what you can do. There's an app called iNaturalist. On this app, you download the app, you can take pictures of fish. And if you upload those pictures to the iNaturalist app, um, it will automatically add it to the Fishes of Alberta project where we can track um, 53 species so far and counting have been added to this database. And I'd love to have more additions. I don't know if you know this, but you can get a fishing license uh, and that fishing license permits you in, in proper locations to place up to two minnow traps. So you can find the little guys, take pictures of them, release them back into the same water in which you caught them and add that data to the Fishes of Alberta project. In this way, we can track where fish are located, where they're moving to and new invaders. You can see so far, it's been mostly recreational fish that have been added to that list. Um, because those are the people who are most often taking pictures. Okay, so here we are now at the end. Um, you have about 15 minutes after this presentation ends. Here's a fish I haven't shown you. It's not actually found in the province, but its cousins are. What family of those 19 families I took you through, what family does this fish belong to? Send me an email, matthew.morris at ambrose.edu with your answer. I'll, I'll put this back up again in a moment, and I'll do a random draw for one of my guides. Okay, I'd like to thank Nature Calgary um, for in, in inviting me today, Ambrose University, of course, where I work, Trud Unlimited for letting me be a part of their fish rescues, where a lot of the pictures came from, Waterford Press for getting me to think about this stuff in the first place, and iNaturalist for making pictures freely available uh, so that uh, we can share them with the public. 
So thank you all. Um, let me, I'll take my email in the chat. We'll probably only have a, a few minutes for questions. I'm happy to hang out a little bit longer though, uh, if you'd like. Well, thanks, Matthew. That was a great presentation. Um, you talked about uh, catching uh, minnows. Um, when I was a kid, we used to get a plastic bag, put a little piece of hot dog in it and open the bag up underwater and the minnows would swim in to the plastic bag and then we would just close the bag and we had ourselves a little uh, flock, flock, I guess that's a bird thing, <laughs> a school. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> a yeah. school of minnows that we, yeah. we, could, we could bring home. So um, yeah, so if you want to bait your little fish trap, uh, I well, recommend you... hot dog. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I used hot dog to catch stickleback for a while as well out in BC. And then we moved on to dog food. And then we discovered you didn't need bait at all. They, they're just curious animals. They like to explore their environment and they'll they'll find the trap and work their way in. You have okay. to be careful with bait because you can't you can't do bait in uh, uh, in every location. So you got to follow the regulations there. Um, but fish are curious. Put a minnow trap in there, and, and you'll find where they go, or they or sorry, they'll find uh, the the trap. And sorry, I saw there was a question about where to get minnow traps. Um, you can get them at Bass Pro Shop. You can get them at Canadian Tire. Um, you can buy them through Amazon. Um, you know, some are are better than others. They'll have different mesh sizes and things like this, but. Uh, you know, a, a, a standard minnow trap will catch crayfish uh, and a, a variety of minnows that are are kicking around. You know, I've tossed them um, in Fish Creek just for, you know, two hours. You don't want to leave them too long. You don't want, you know, the fish to get eaten by um, other animals that might make their way into the trap. A, cu a couple hours and you'll, you'll get a few fish. Um, you might get lucky and get a ton. But try it out. Take pictures. Put them on the iNaturalist app. And again, here's the fish there. I'm going to take that down now, but send me an email, please. Let me know what you think this fish belongs to. You can see the defining features here already. We do have one question from Alan. Um, are fish doing well in Alberta overall as far as numbers are concerned? Oh, that's that's a hard question. Um, yes and no. Uh, a lot of our minnows are and smaller, non-recreationally important fish species seem to be doing okay. Um, our larger native uh, trouts and, and walleyes and pikes are not doing terribly well. Um, in part, that's because, it, it, well, if you go to the uh, Bow Habitat Station and the, and the Sam Livingston Hatchery, they have this nice little display on fishing pressure in the province. We don't have a lot of freshwater resources, right? especially not compared to Manitoba and Saskatchewan and uh, Ontario, so, but we have a ton of anglers. And the number of anglers per lake is orders of magnitude higher in Alberta than it is in other provinces. And so we have to continually supplement, supplement, supplement with hatchery released fish um, because otherwise we'd be in real trouble. Um, in fact, you may remember that our commercial fisheries were closed down by the provincial government a few years back um, because there just weren't enough fish to go around um, and to share with the recreational fishers. So they closed down uh, across the entire province, the commercial fishing. Um, and, and that's... That's led to some legal battles, and I'm not sure what the final outcome has been on that, because it seems like there was one sort of fishing sector in the province where they needed to shut down the commercial fishing, and they didn't assess the others, but they just made a unilateral decision to shut it all down. But you'll see, like, you know, you can't take pike out of certain areas. You can't take walleye out of certain areas anymore. You have to get special permits to do that, and that reflects the fact that they're not doing as well as they were doing 50, 60 years ago. So we have a couple more questions as well. Um, next one, uh, what is the most common fish in the Elbow River? Oh, geez, this is a good question. Um, I, I, I'm gonna just hazard a guess because I haven't uh, thoroughly sampled the Elbow, but just based on um, on what I see, I, I'm gonna guess it's the long-nosed dace. They are just wildly abundant uh, everywhere you go around Calgary. Um, but I haven't done I haven't done uh, counts. Now, Trout Unlimited does have data from their annual fish rescues um, uh, of fish entrained in irrigation canals. So they have the counts on every fish that they find there. And 
I'd hazard to guess that the long nose dace are are number one or number two. You get a lot of long nose suckers as well, um, in those particular areas. But boy, those those long nose dace are everywhere. You go down to Fish Creek Park, and again, you walk in there with your bare feet, and you just stand there for a couple minutes. Um, you're gonna have maybe you know ten fish, twenty fish swimming around your toes, uh, maybe nibbling on you, and, and every one of those is a long nose dace. And then um, we've got a question about the Prussian carp. Um, are they a danger to the other fish species? Oh, the Prussian carp are, are interesting. Um, it's known that they change aquatic ecosystems. They, they do have sort of knock-on effects on the other creatures that live there. Um, so some of the zooplankton and phytoplankton, for instance, can change when Prussian carp are around. Um, there's no known instance of a Prussian carp driving another species to extinction. Um, but it, they can increase the turbidity of the water. People don't love having them in their community lakes uh, because they'll, they'll blame the turbidity on those Prussians. So they can do that. Um, but I think the jury's out as to whether they're going to drive anything out. You have to keep in mind, and this is something I didn't get a chance to talk about, but Alberta is a post-glacial province which means that 10,000 years ago, there were no fish in the province, uh, except maybe in Cypress Hills where there's a, a little glacial refugia, which means everything we have has invaded the province recently. Um, and when that happens, that often means there's a lot of available niche spaces, a lot of opportunities for creatures to continually invade without competing with other species. And it's possible that's what we have in Alberta. If you think of rainbow trout, brook trout, brown trout that have all been introduced to the province, none of them have driven any of the native species to extinction. And yet these are voracious predators, right? Um, and so it's it, to, to say that the Prussians are uniquely different from those rainbows and brooks and browns that we like, um, to, to my mind, that's that's problematic. Uh, the, there just isn't the, the data to say that they're that big of a threat to our freshwater fish. Now, they might compete for resources and the numbers might go down a bit for some of the minnows and things like this, but um, it's, it, it's not clear. All right, we have two more questions. Um, uh, so I'll start with the first one and then after that, we'll cut it off. Um, what do you think of commercial uh, freshwater farming here in Alberta? Yeah, there's a number of species. I didn't, I didn't talk about that either. There are species that aren't uh, native to the province that are commercially farmed. Um, so there are bullhead that are farmed in the province. There are tilapia that are farmed in the province. Um, I'm actually, I, I, I don't, I don't think I have much of a, an issue with commercial uh, freshwater farming. I think it's better than what they do on the coast with uh, marine fish, where your salmonids are raised in sea cages right next to wild salmon rivers, and then they escape and they right, wreak havoc on those rivers. That's not what you have in a completely entrained or sort of enclosed uh, inland system. And so they're, they're relatively isolated from the, the um, native freshwater fishes that we have in the province. All right. Uh, is there a fish species that you would really uh, that would really worry or scare you if you were to find it in Alberta? Uh, snakeheads. Yeah, there there's been some reports of snakehead in Ontario and in BC, and I think maybe one in Manitoba, if I recall. Uh, these are fish that are extremely resistant to envir uh, environmental disasters, like they tolerate low oxygen, extreme colds, voracious predators. Um, uh, I, I, they're, they're a nasty fish. I, I would not want to find them in the province. All right. Um, well, there's actually two more questions and I think we can probably get them in. Um, one is our grass carp, a uh, risk to other fish here. Yeah, that's a good question too. So they're, they're considered biocontrol. There, there was a series of experiments done in, geez, was it the eighties or something to see if they could effectively remove vegetation in the province from, um, uh, artificial ponds. And they did a pretty good job cleaning those out. So, I mean, you know, you go to these lakes here in Calgary and the seaweed sort of piles up on the shore and it's all gross. And so rather than drain the entire lake and clean it, which is what they'd have to do before, you just dump grass carp in there and they'll help uh, keep control of that. Um, as I said, they're triploid, which is supposed to make them sterile. The problem is it's a the sterility has to do with how egg production works. Uh, it's called meiosis. And... Uh, when you're triploid, you get maybe two chromosomes for of one set going into an egg, but one of another going into the same egg, and that unbalances things and things go awry. But if you were to randomly have 
two copies of each chromosome or one copy of each chromosome going into an egg, that would be perfectly viable. And since they can make millions of eggs, the odds of that happening are actually not as slim as we might like to believe. Um, there's no example to my knowledge, though, of grass carp successfully reproducing in a triploid state. Uh, this is the same strategy they use for transgenically modified rainbows out in PEI, uh, where they've inserted a growth hormone from another fish so that they'll grow all through the winter. And then they get these giant sizes. They made them triploid as well, so that if they were to escape, they wouldn't be able to reproduce with the um, other uh, introduced rainbows in the area. So, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, there's always a risk. Nature finds a way, as my favorite movie reminds us. Um, but I'd say the risk is probably minimal. These aren't like the silver carp, uh, although they're related, right? And then one last question, how long does it take for an introduced species to become a native species? Uh, technically never. Um, the, the way we, well, let me think about this. So the Species at Risk Act does not include anything introduced by humans within the last 50 years as wildlife believe that's true so anything older than that would count as wildlife and maybe deserve some protections but anything younger than that wouldn't um boy i need to double check that though there's so it might be if they were naturally moved into the province within the last 50 years they're not considered wildlife i don't remember if it's for for um human introduced things um typically like star considered um, non-native to the province they've been around forever right um, but uh, you are right that we think on short time scales when introductions happen over long time scales and that every species in the province is introduced because it it, it arrived through natural dispersal mechanisms within the last 10,000 years or so well, great thank you very much I'll let John uh, close it out but uh, thank you very much for answering all those questions yeah I like it, to, well yeah well, I'd like to, first of all, thank Kaya and Nature Alberta making this uh, sort of joint uh, program available for clubs across the province. And certainly would like to like to thank uh, Matthew Morris for his stimulating talk on fish. I didn't know how you could become excited about fish, but now I am. <laughs> good, good. <laughs> Well, thank so you for I, the invitation. I really appreciate it. Sorry for going a little bit long. Oh, I no. talk a lot about fish. That, <laughs> Just that, that's, that was great. Great talk. So that ends our meeting for tonight. And as we approach Christmas, I hope to, uh, on behalf of Nature Calgary's board, uh, wish everybody a, a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And hopefully nature will treat us well moving on into 2023. So take care, everybody, and we'll catch you again. Bye. My, thank you very much. Please send me, I, th I think I'm getting emails now. So send them off with your guess on that fish, please.